So kind of just uh, jumping in, um, Shane, if you want, would you be able to uh, kind of kind of give us a rundown of uh, what crypto tax calculator is and uh, what kind of brought you to, you know, um, you know, leading this organization and kind of building it from the ground up? Yeah, sure. So crypto tax calculator, it, it does exactly what it sounds like. It um, helps you calculate your crypto taxes. Um, started the project back in 2018. So I was actually building out a decentralized exchange back then, um, you know, Xerox Relayer. And I had um, quite a lot of my own transactions, particularly on-chain transactions. And um, the problem that we set out to tackle was how do you do your taxes when you no longer have a financial middleman? Um, so it's all well and good if you're trading, say, just on Coinbase and they can generate a tax report for you. Um, or even if you've traded on Coinbase and then flipped over to Binance and then you've got to merge those CSVs, et cetera, to try to work out your tax report. But what are you meant to do if you've, you know, you've been trading on Ethereum, you've been on Uniswap, you've bounced over to PancakeSwap, now you're on Arbitrum, you know, you're in the L2 kind of sphere. Um, but what do you, how do you get your, your tax statement? Like, how do you find this out? Do you go knocking on the door of Vitalik to try to get him to give it to you? Like, what, what do you do when there's no financial middleman there? Um, you know, just like you need to be the keeper of your private keys, you need to also keep your tax records, um, your transaction records for tax purposes. And uh, that's that could be incredibly burdensome, uh, especially back then, um, so we set out to build some software uh, specifically tackling that problem, like, you know, what getting software to work in the decentralized space. And um, it was a painful couple of years at the beginning. Uh, the problem itself is actually really challenging. It's something that I thought would just take a few days of my own time to run a script for the EVM, but it turns out that there's lots of different ways of kind of thinking about this problem. Um, uh, yeah, so we rewrote actually based on probably the first two years of learning, uh, relaunched that. And um, also in, back in 2018, there was a deep, dark bear market. Um, but happened that, you know, 2020 was the year for us. Um, there was a lot of, uh, you know, DeFi summer came around. So actually people were using these decentralized products. And then to back that up, there's been the NFT explosion. So now... You know, if you want to do anything with an NFT, you've got to be on really open sea, and you are actually using decent, like you're actually doing crypto at this stage. Um, so it's kind of open up to the mass market. Um, you know, we're starting to see a lot of traction. Um, just got some funding. Uh, Coinbase Ventures was part of that round, and on top of a few other players, but that would be the one that most uh, most of the audience here would be familiar with. Um, and yeah, just uh, it's a it's a hard problem, right? Like, what I think what we're seeing, even with how many people are in the audience right now, you know, there's a lot of uh, questions around cryptocurrency taxes. What does it mean? Um, you know, when I've been staking and I'm receiving all these rewards, how do these NFTs taxed? You know, how how do these protocols like what's the tax implications of what I've been doing late at night for the last year? Um, and it doesn't help that there's not a lot of guidance out there from tax authorities. It also doesn't help that you go talk to three different tax lawyers and you get three different opinions. And um, yeah, it doesn't, yeah, it's just, it's a difficult problem. Uh, I guess that's the issue of being at the very edge of this technology really. And, you know, just like there was a lot of questions about domain names and buying and selling domain names back in, um, the early 90s we're kind of in that type of space where there's just uncertainty from it it's entry that keeps people from even starting to do their crypto taxes because i at least you know from my perspective you know me being you know a classic degen as well not only the community manager here but also being a degen um you know it's it's kind of like a it seems like a daunting thing to like maybe like start doing your crypto taxes when you feel like maybe you should have been doing them a long time ago, but haven't. Um, do you think that maybe, maybe that's the biggest barrier to entry? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, it's like looking up at the at a mountain and thinking, geez, that's a long way to climb. And it just, you know, you don't even want to get started. It's that typical procrastination, really. Um, certainly record keeping, that's probably the barrier. You know, how, how do you get your records together? Uh, and that's kind of, that's the problem that we're trying to solve there, but not to show the point of the product too hard. Um, the point is, you know, it's, it's easier, uh, it's not as hard as what your mind might make it out to be. Um, it's just a matter of stepping through it and doing the work and tackling it piece by piece. Um, the reality is for a lot of people, um, they might not have been thinking about this problem for a couple of years, and that could be for a few different reasons. That, you know, they might not have realised at the beginning of their trading activity that they did need to keep appropriate records. Or they might have thought that they're just going to dabble with it, and of course you get caught in the um, uh, caught up as the the mark in the market, and then you know two years later you're looking at it going, oh, what what just happened? Um, and then you're kind of trying to work, piece together you piece together exactly what you've been up to. Um, so, but really, what it comes down to is just it's like you had a party at the house, you know, like you have a big party. And now the, the house is a bit messy and, you know, it could be a bit of a hangover type of experience where you've got to look at it and go, okay, well, you know, I've got to clean it up. Where do you start? Where can I possibly start? You, you know you need to do it. It's like death and taxes. You're going to have to do it. And so the best place to start is just cleaning up, a, you know, a little bit of like a room, just get the motivation going, get into it. Um, so that's kind of the same thing with crypto taxes is, you know, get signed up to the platform. Just start adding in your wallet addresses, just trying to recall what you've been up to, what exchanges you've used, etc. And then as you import more and more data, uh, the software will kind of get smarter in terms of being able to recognise what's missing. And that will guide you through that process um, to reduce the amount of reconciliation errors that you might be experiencing when you first start off. Um, so it's really, it's a bit like a diary um, where ideally, you know, you've kept your diary of all your transaction history up to date. That typically, if you go back and try to write the diary from like a couple of years ago, you, know, have, you have to scratch the mind at the beginning. But as you get into it, you start to remember more and more things. And you can even look at, you know, the diary of your transaction history and you'll be able to see holes. Where is this missing information? You'll be able to... Re there'll be certain things that stand out to you that you'll be able to recollect and go, oh, okay, I was actually, I remember that transaction. That's when I lost all this money. <laughs> you know, there's certain things that stand out. Um, and so you'll be able to look back. And pressure. Yeah. Yeah, that, that could be extremely stressful. We do deal with clients in that type of situation it's not pretty you know they're, they're they are quite flustered to put it mildly um and so yeah it's it's just better to kind of i mean it's good if you're listening to this you're already making the first steps right like you're already here thinking about it and so it's just it's not as burdensome as you might think and it it would be really good to get it off your chest and you know get the weight off your shoulders in terms of getting through and getting all your records up to date as well. I think um, to kind of add on to that, um, you know, and this will bring me uh, on to my next point is maybe, you know, I think like another common thing is that uh, people kind of look at crypto taxes as like this huge like behemoth compared to like, you know, any of your other taxes that you do for the year. Um, can you maybe give us some insight on what the differences are between quote unquote like crypto taxes versus quote unquote regular taxes? Or is there a difference? Is there not a difference? I mean, love your thoughts on that. Yeah, so a lot of people hear the word cryptocurrency and it really colors, you know, their perception. You know, it sounds really kind of big and scary. But one way I think about this is that, you know, it's just really it's just the digital transformation of assets and you're securing those assets cryptographically, you know, the same way that your mail is now being digitized and you secure your email address with a password, that's also cryptographic, right? 
Um, so it's just like digitization of known assets. And so a lot of rules in, you know, the old world, I guess, for lack of a better word, still apply in this new world. Um, most tax authorities, and it really depends on the tax jurisdiction, but most tax authorities kind of, um, you know, look at these types of transactions and see what they most closely resemble and then apply similar rules um, so that as to not distort the market as well. Um, you don't want to have a situation where cryptocurrency, you know, as a as a industry is negatively affected from a tax perspective, but you also, um, from the other side, you don't want it to be favourably affected um, from a long-term perspective. For, you know, that's how other participants in the market think as well. So you just want it to be fairly neutral, would be the best tax authority's position there. Um, but, uh, and this is going back to probably a disclaimer, like none of this is uh, tax advice or financial advice, it's just me talking on the internet and always uh, reach out to your own tax professional to get an understanding of the tax consequences of your transactions. Um, but typically, you know, if you buy an asset, then you later sell that asset. And it can be dependent on your jurisdiction, but typically there's this concept of capital gains. So it's different to income, like I did a job and I got paid as compensation, right, for my time. That's more income. Um, it, it's this concept of oh, I bought, you know, a bar of gold and the, the value of the gold's gone up 10x and now I sell it, that's a capital gain, generally speaking. It kind of sits on the capital account. Um, and so these these are treated as, you know, capital gain events in most situations where you're buying and selling cryptocurrency if it's considered to be an asset. Uh, however, there are other ways of this being taxed. Uh, just to add some complexity here. Uh, for example, if you're in the business of buying and selling cars, for example, um, then no longer might this be considered a capital gain, but it's actually just considered revenue to that business, you know, rather than you know a one-off purchase of a collectible car and then it's gone up in value and then you go sell it. Uh, same same deal in crypto. If you're kind of engaging in a professional manner. Is the important situation then in again depending on your jurisdiction you might be considered um to be uh, you know a trader for tax purposes or you know this is kind of as a business and then that could be uh different types of tax rules um typically in a lot of jurisdictions there's you know this idea of long-term capital gains discounts where there's an incentive to not speculate in the market but to actually hold the asset more than a certain amount of time and uh, you know those types of discounts don't typically apply to business revenue uh, but then there's other things that you can claim with business revenue such as you know costs and expenses which as an investor you might not be able to claim so there's kind of like pros and cons and it's really if you are dealing with significant volumes or significant amounts of money, um, it's probably actually worth getting some tax advice there uh, because how you set yourself up as an entity, whether you're an individual or a business, can really affect um, your tax outcome. And it's it's probably not something you need to think about as just a, you know, a hobbyist type of investor if it's just a small amount of money, etc., but if it does start to get anywhere near significant, and that can happen in crypto, you know, somebody gets into crypto, they buy the right NFT or whatever, and it goes up 10x or 100x, and suddenly that, you know, $1,000 outlay is actually a meaningful amount of money. It's worth uh, really considering how to think about this from a tax perspective. Uh, the worst thing you want to do is just pretend that there is no taxes and just put your head in the sand and say, oh, this is a problem for another day. And then wake up three years later going and and realizing that if you only had have just done this one thing, whether that's you know structuring your activity different or setting up a business or done this particular transaction, you could have actually saved yourself 
you know, huge percentages in tax. Um, so it, it's really worth um, understanding the tax obligations because at the end of the day, what you're really interested in isn't your gross amount, it's the net. You know, what's, what's your actual gain after taxes? That's what you care about. And um, yeah, it's a bit of an afterthought. I guess, but as the as the market matures, there's more people who are quite used to dealing with this. I mean, it's quite common with stocks, right? Um, so I do think it's a, it's something to be aware of, though. But there's certainly tax consequences, and pretty much when, whatever you're transacting in crypto, there could be tax consequences. And not only do you be need to be keeping and maintaining accurate records, um, but you need to be probably thinking about those tax consequences ideally ahead of time as well. Um, there's also other things you could do in crypto, particularly now, um, you know, you can earn income in crypto, right? like you can earn income in lots of different forms. You could get paid in crypto, like I go out and do a job for a protocol and they decide to pay me in crypto. Well, that kind of looks a lot like normal income. And, um, you know, uh, if you if you're selling nfts on a regular basis like you're an artist and this is what you do you sell nfts you know that that looks like a business with income um if you're kind of depositing into a protocol and then you're receiving a reward like a staking reward I mean, it, it, it smells a lot like you're depositing into a bank account and you're receiving interest on that deposit so I mean, the tax consequences could be similar. And so you really do need to be um, thinking about this as well because the one thing with income tax is that it kind of sits separately, the capital, the capital account. And so, again, depending on your jurisdiction, but in a lot of jurisdictions, there's this kind of ability to offset a capital loss with a capital gain. And you might be able to do that within the one year, etc. But usually they're kind of considered separate accounts. So you can't offset a capital loss against your income or there might be a restriction to that. And uh, this can catch people off guard. You know, if you've earned $100,000 in income in a particular token uh, and you decided to hold on to that token and then the token has dropped 90%, well, so, you know, you had your 100 grand in income, but then you've got a 90K loss, capital, a capital loss. You might not be able to offset or some or all of the $100,000 income there, mm, which is really painful if you've only got 10 grand left. Um, yeah, you, know, you could get yourself theoretically into some really awkward situations depending on your tax jurisdiction there. So again, it's important to consider what's the tax liability at this point in time because uh, for, for that particular example, the choice to hold on to the asset when you'd received it, like $100,000 worth of it, you know, that is a choice and that choice holds risk from a tax perspective because really, you know, the expectations from tax authorities is that as you're transacting, you're kind of setting aside enough money to pay for your taxes. The same deal if you're a business, right? Like if you're a business and you're, earning, you're an e-commerce store, you've got sales tax, et cetera, um, and you've got, you know, um, income tax for your employees, et cetera, and you earn all this revenue and then you just go out and spend it all and you've got nothing left at the end of the day, like a zero dollar balance, um, and you haven't set aside any money for taxes, you know, the, you're going to get yourself into a lot of trouble in that situation. And uh, it's the same type of uh, duty of care, which is kind of put on to investors in the cryptocurrency space because, um, you know, it's it's kind of it's it's deemed as your responsibility to consider these tax consequences and how much money you should be setting aside as you're transacting. So it really isn't something that you want to be putting your head in the sand about because it's just going to be all painful down the track. Um, usually, that in 
encourage like a leads to a flight or fight response um but really what you want to do is just approach this problem logically and just as i suggested at the start just kind of you know crack away at it over time so that you can kind of get on top of your tax obligations and at that point you can kind of keep um your records up to date moving forward and it'll be a lot easier awesome so yeah that, i mean and uh, i think just just for anyone who had joined kind of midway uh, to kind of uh, sum up there a little bit if you haven't started your taxes yet um definitely you know get started now sign up for the service and kind of uh you know, uh, don't don't stick your head in the sand, uh, as you said, Shane. Uh, you know, um, you don't want to kind of get caught uh, just procrastinating. Um, and on the other note, you know, if possible, again, none of this is uh, financial or tax advice, um, but you know, try to have some capital uh, always on the side, ready to pay taxes if it need be. Um, just our thoughts. Uh, so now that we got a little bit of that kind of like kind of basic tax information. Um, out of the way, uh, maybe we can kind of jump into more like the crypto native stuff. Uh, you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but um, let's talk about maybe a little bit more about um, how NFTs are factored into taxes. Because uh, obviously, you know, NFTs have blown up the past year and a half. Um, I'm sure that's what most of the, most uh, tax professionals are going to be kind of ha- kind of be having brought to them. Like, oh, hey, 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 Mr. Tax Guy, you know. I made a whole bunch of money off this ape. What do I do? <laughs> um, or, you know, maybe they were doing DeFi and they had this Uniswap V3 position that's supposed to represent their tokens, but it's an NFT. Um, could you maybe kind of talk a little bit more about that uh, and how like NFTs and taxes, uh, uh, NFTs are treated uh, within taxes? Yeah, so again, not tax advice. Um, it's just uh, general information for anyone just joining. Um, just my own personal opinions based on the conversations that I've been having with different tax lawyers and CPAs, et cetera. And a lot of this um, this information really depends on your tax jurisdiction. And so I'm going to make the assumption that people are globally based. So I'll just talk at a high level. Um, but there's a lot of logic there that does apply just globally. Um, so with NFTs, you know, it's a it's a token that represents you know it's a signature really on uh, on something some sort of asset whether that's a JPEG like an artwork whatever it is there's some sort of representation here that kind of gives it value and that 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 value changes depending on on what the market thinks it's worth at this time so you know if you buy something and then you later sell it and there's a gain probably got to think about the tax consequences there's i mean depending on your tax jurisdiction but there's most likely some sort of taxes on that gain now and there there could be rules around that like say in the us it's pretty clear that that's taxable um but in germany you know if you held it more than a year it might not be taxable at all so there's there's all types of different kind of nuances there but the important point is that you still need to calculate what the gain was you need to look at you know what was the purchase time what was the sale time how much time has actually passed etc i mean just to plug our software there this is what our software does right but um yeah you kind of you you do have this um concept of you know most most of the time capital gains on nfts Uh, one thing that really kind of catches people and it's not immediately obvious, is how did you get the NFT in the first place? And what did you do? And most of the time, I mean, because NFTs are actually de- like you know, this is actually crypto stuff. Like, you've got to be in crypto to buy an NFT. Uh, so it's unlikely that you just purchased that NFT with US dollars. You probably purchased it with ETH or something similar. Um and, and so what was the gain on that disposal of the cryptocurrency? And so there was this catch that I saw, heard of recently with a prominent CPA that specializes with NFT taxes. And he was kind of saying, you know, like, um, uh, like 
over the change of the financial year there from 2021 to 2022 in the US, there was a change of financial year and uh, people had disposed of ETH to purchase an NFT. And so you go buy this NFT for 10 grand worth of ETH, for example, and they've realized the gain on the disposal of ETH. And now they're holding the NFT and the NFT, like the market dropped out from under their feet and it's down 90%. They've only got a thousand dollars. Like the the value of that NFT is, you know, maybe worthless, or maybe it's worth a thousand bucks now. But they've realised the gain of nine grand, uh, sorry, of ten grand in the prior year, and and now they've got to pay taxes on that ten grand. But what they've got left is this NFT that might be in this, you know, particularly nightmarish situation. It's now worthless. Like nobody wants to buy it. Uh, but you still got your taxes from last year and you still got to pay taxes on that. See, it's kind of like this double whammy. And if you hadn't known this uh, prior, you might have gone, oh, you know, rather than holding it through the bear market, let's actually realise this loss. And then, you know, based on that realisation of the loss, okay, at least at least my tax is reduced from the last year and I can go out and maybe buy something else with that remaining money, et cetera. So this concept of, you know, not just the NFT itself, but what are you doing leading up to the purchase that, of that NFT? There's other things, like if you're going to mint the NFT, like you're playing a video game and you, and you mint, that, mint an NFT in the game, etc. You know, the disposal of that asset from a minting perspective, um, again, same type of problem. You know, what's the gain or loss on the minting? So it's really about the gains and losses. Once you've got the gain or loss and like, you know, the time interval and it's, it gets a lot easier to work out what your taxes are, then it's really about, you know, your individual circumstances, are you a business, are you an individual for those types of things. Um, but getting to actually those calculations could be burdensome, particularly if you're just trading, you know, from your wallet. I mean, where's the transaction history? So that's where the pain is. Um, and you've got to consider all of this, um, you know, like say if you're in the US, they want to know the prices in US dollars. They don't care about the ETH pegged price or whatever. What's what's actual US dollars? So that's another burden is, you know, how do, how do you get the fiat denominated value of this asset at the time of the transaction? Um, uh, there's all these catches, right? Like you've got gas fees, for example, and if you bought ETH back when it was a dollar and now it's, I haven't seen the latest ticker price, but you know, say it's two and a half thousand USD at the moment. That's a two and a half thousand X return on that ETH. And so if you're spending 200 bucks on gas fees, you know, maybe most of that is profit. And so you've got to consider the gain on the gas fee itself. Or if you had gone and bought the ETH at the top of the market, right, when it was five grand, and four and a half grand, I think it got up to US, and now you, you're paying gas fees, but you, your ETH is half the price. You could actually potentially be claiming a loss there. Um, of course, talk to your tax professional about it. But there, there's this, there's, it's not just the asset itself, it's the gas fees, it's everything. You've got to really, because in a lot of ways, from the tax authority's perspective, it's kind of like, you know, you've got these transactions in crypto, you could do all this weird stuff, right, which you didn't make a lot of sense in in the normal traditional finance, because in traditional finance, not everything's programmatic, is actually the difference here. It's not all digital. It's kind of like, you know, you've got this UI interface, but the backend system is this archaic thing that's been built like 20, 30 years ago in a bank or, you know, it's got to be like registered and settled. Like if you buy stocks and there's somebody actually ticks this off at the end of the day, etc. You know, what, what this crypto thing actually is in my mind is just digital transformation of the existing financial industry. And once you have digital transformation, you can do all these cool stuff like it's pure digital native stuff and so you know you could do all these weird and wacky kind of financial instruments now and you got things like oh it's like really like i mean you know project i don't know where the project is now but like really weird ideas right like which you can just program 
up. Whereas you couldn't really do this when you when you kind of are you in the old world where you have to deal with lawyers and contracts and everything takes three days to settle, etc. Um, what I'm trying to get at is really like the complexity of what you're doing is, you know, the complexity of what you can do in crypto is just increased, right? It's just more creative. There's more things. There's more freedom of expression here. And so now you could do things like, you know, you're paying for one cryptocurrency with another cryptocurrency. So you're buying an NFT, an NFT with ETH, for example. Maybe it's wrapped ETH on the Solana network. But then you're disposing of Solana to pay for the fee. So it's kind of like you're buying Google stock, the Tesla stock, but then you're selling Apple stock to pay for the fee. I, I, I mean, if you say that, it's like, yeah, if you, you know, that sounds like a nightmare tax situation. It is. It is. And so you need to think about this a bit. And obviously, I mean, that's the pain point that I've been trying to cover off. Yeah, and like our team's dedicated towards making a little bit less of a nightmare situation. But, you know, it, it's really, you can relate it back to traditional finance and kind of think about it in that, that way. Um, but there are some pretty weird things in crypto and it would be great to get some, because there are some certainly gray areas there. For example, rebasing tokens and what's the tax consequences of rebasing. And really, it just depends on what tax lawyer you talk to. You know, you're going to get different opinions, and it probably needs to get settled in a court of law. Um, or, like, you know, tax authority comes out with better guidelines. Um, and typically, the tax authorities, they kind of, they have a, a tendency to take some time to come out with guidelines. Like, back in 2016, 17, if you're in this space back then, it was really debatable, you know, in the US whether crypto to crypto transactions were actually a taxable event. Uh, back then, you know, this was like just as ETH started, right? And so, you know, people weren't really doing crypto to crypto transactions. They were buying and selling Bitcoin. You know, that was the common thing. So when you all of a sudden you had Bitcoin and ETH trades, you know, is this taxable? That was a big thing back then. It took like years for the tax authorities to come out and not all tax jurisdictions have done this, but some have. Um, you know, they come out and said, yeah, absolutely, this is taxable. It's like a barter trade. You're selling one asset for another. We don't care that you haven't transacted back into fiat value. It's just like, you know, if you if you buy a, a car, it, it, it turns out to be, you know, vintage now, and now you've sold it for a million dollars, but you don't actually sell it. You just like swap it with some dude for a house, you know, that that's going to be a taxable transaction as well. That's the same type of logic. Um, so uh, what I'm saying here is, you know, tax guidance, you know, it took them a long time to come up with that tax guidance and probably, you know, there'll still be some time before we get some real clarity on tax authorities about some of these edge case scenarios. Uh, when it comes to transactions that you can do in cryptocurrency. Um, uh, so you just need to keep in mind of that as well, because it can, you could be carrying, um, okay, it's a risk, right? It's a tax risk, you know, tax burden. There's a risk that, you know, the way that you are thinking about these transactions and the way that you're declaring it might go against the guidelines that come out in the future and then you have to go back and amend it and so you might have tax consequences there and you you want to be in, you don't want to be in a situation where you know you've gone and amended the tax return and it turns out you own you owe another 20 grand and you've already gone and spent that um, you know uh, so there's all these kind of there are risks in um, kind of being on the fringe um, like my myself personally back in the day I didn't really put any money aside for crypto to crypto transactions I didn't realize back then that it was taxable and you know I got caught out by this myself and it, it was burdensome and so there's a lot of people out there who are probably going to be facing uh, similar situations with their tax obligations and it's just it's really important to try to especially if you're dealing with significant sums of money um, to try to get an understanding with, um, you know, talking to a tax professional, et cetera, about, you know, what, 
what potential outcomes there might be of this particular transaction. Um, you know, a really common one is liquidity pools, right? Liquidity pools on Uniswap, like your standard liquidity pool token, like particularly the V2, V3 is even a bit more complex, but V2, when you could, you know, deposit two assets into a pool and you get back a liquidity pool token, and what's actually going on there from a tax perspective. So like our software will track the cost basis as you deposit the two assets into the pool and it will associate it to the, the liquidity pool token. Um, but then how you kind of deal with that uh, depends on really what kind of tax advice you get and what kind of jurisdiction you're in. And there's some arguments there about, um, you know, there's this concept in, in, in tax, I guess, with beneficial beneficial ownership, you know, do you still kind of have ownership over this asset or have you disposed of it? Does someone else now have beneficial ownership of that asset? And so if you do dispose of it, then there might be a tax consequence. And, um, you know, like the UK recently came out with guidelines suggesting that when you, you can't actually lend crypto, that it's actually actually a change of beneficial ownership and there's a tax consequence of that uh and i mean that's one particular tax authority you might not live in the uk but the thing is all these tax jurisdictions they tend to converge to a large extent and they tend to share information so what's happening in one tax jurisdiction might give you a perception of what's going to happen in the future in the us um and if you were to do like if you were to take that type of idea extend it to liquidity pool tokens and I mean the actual calculation what that would look like is that you're actually selling the assets for that liquidity pool token but then when you go and you know deposit that liquidity pool token back into the liquidity pool and get the funds back out is again it's another type of transaction where you're kind of selling the liquidity pool token and you're acquiring these new assets and you know, the sale price was actually the value of these two new assets. It's kind of like a an agreement to sell with the right to buy back at a future date. And then at that point, you know, is the difference interest? What is it? Is it capital gain, et cetera? So that can kind of, you know, that's where you do want to be talking to a tax professional, particularly if it's a significant sum of money. It's quite, until there's clear guidelines on that, it's really quite hard to determine exactly how you want to be declaring that. I'm certainly not going to make any suggestions there. It's just all these things, right? And those things become, you know, substantial questions as you increase the amount of uh, value that you're playing around with in this ecosystem as a proportion of your entire net worth. I mean, if, if you got 10K, but all you own is 10K, well, then that's significant for you. Um, right. And so it's just something to be considerate about, um, as well as also the long-term capital gains effects. So, you know, a lot of tax jurisdictions, they give these discounts based on how long you've been holding that asset. And if you go and partake in a particular transaction, does that reset the amount of time that you've been holding that asset as well? Uh, so it's, <laughs> I, mean, I guess there's a reason why people like to put their head in the sand. Uh, because yeah. <laughs> the reality is you either kind of try that means the more educated your decision making is and the more you think in the world that will positively affect you rather than something which turns out to be really stupid decision with a significant financial impact. And I think, you know, I think, an, again, part of that kind of, uh, a, I guess you'd say, equation that it, it's the amount of people that up until this point have used crypto as, you know, use cryptocurrency um, to buy and sell goods, like physical stuff. Um, cause obviously there are a lot more services, especially nowadays that allow you to spend your ETH, spend your BTC, spend your USDC, whatever it is, um, to buy like a physical good and don't even think about that as a, as a taxable event. You know, um, uh, I, I think, I think that kind of side of part of the equation really, really intrigues me. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, it, 
it doesn't help that different tax jurisdictions have different perspectives on this. Like, for example, I mean, you could maybe tell by my voice I'm Australian. In Australia, there's this class of asset, you know, class of um, tax called personal use. Like, if it was for personal use, then it's tax free up to a certain amount. Uh, but then, you know, it's, it's really grey, that category as well. So it doesn't help that, you know, it's not always the same depending on what tax jurisdiction you is, and that can add confusion to the market, particularly when you're, like, deep diving into this subject on Reddit, which is a global platform, right, and, you know, you might hear one piece of advice that might be applicable to just some other tax jurisdiction. Um, but certainly there's also an argument even in Australia there, you know, if you bought Bitcoin back when it was a couple of bucks and you held it for 10 years with the expectation of a profit, is it really personal use or was it an investment? Um, I, I think, you know, this, this is going to become probably less murky over time, actually, because I think, you know, again, this digital transformation of financial assets in general, that's really what this ego system looks like and you know we we label it as cryptocurrency today but there's lots of things in crypto that are less and less looking like a currency and more looking like financial instruments or artwork or just what you get in real life right like the, that border is going down and that's exciting because that that's what adoption actually looks like it's just you know like the internet got adopted and no longer is there some weird fringe cases on the internet back in the 90s where you get all types of weird websites and they're pretty crazy if you look at some of those. Um, but now, you know, everything is done online. And uh, I think we're just going to see that more and more. Um, yeah. Gotcha. No, yeah, no, thank you again uh, so much for that. Um, I think we, I would love to hear a little more about, uh, you know, I mean, I guess kind of to move off the, uh, like the, those kind of one-off questions there, because, <laughs> you know, I'm sure you could kind of, you could answer so many specific questions that um, I'm sure we'll actually have some from the community in a little bit. Um, but to kind of jump a little bit more back on like a crypto tax calculator uh, as a whole, um, how has the, you know, the cross chain future that we're seeing now, where there's multiple L1s, multiple L2s, arbitrage obviously being an L2, um, impacted your thought process behind, um, you know, you know, crypto tax calculator as a company, um, and uh, what are some future things you guys are planning to integrate into crypto tax calculator? Yeah, so that uh, widened support for different networks is a uh, something we're heavily investing in. I mean, that's where you know our investors. That's why we went out and got investment from people like Coinbase Ventures, and why they're excited about us is because you know we've already been thinking about that problem since 2018. So it was it was before you know DeFi was cool. It was before NFTs were cool. There was like what was that NFT back in 2017? The name eludes me right now. The popular crypto kitties. Yeah, that thing. You know, <laughs> Was that, you know, it was nothing like what we got today, right? It was so fringe, crazy fringe, right? Um, we've been thinking about that for a while. Um, and now we've got the right tools to be able to plug in networks pretty quickly. And um, yeah, we've got the investments now to be able to scale that up as well. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a big, big thing for us. I think what we're seeing is a convergence in the market around centralized exchanges. You know, back in 2017, it was really common to have like 20 exchanges. Like I remember opening up accounts in the weirdest places because you wanted to get in on this particular token. It was just pumping after its ICO and it was, it was mania, right? And so you'd, you'd have this colossal amount of different exchanges and it was just really hard because, you know, you just had all these different CSVs and it's just a pain in its own right. Um but what we're seeing now is just, um, I think as the market matures, you know, there's a convergence in the centralized exchanges, but there's an explosion in, you know, the actual decentralized world. And, you know, there might be a convergence over time, but in the meantime, everyone's doing everything everywhere. It, uh, yeah, our goal is to be able to support all of that um, and make that kind of experience just as a cryptocurrency user, you know, your long tail of transactions are actually supported um 
we don't believe really anyone else has the right model facilitating that, but we seem to be on the right path there. Um, I think that's represented in the amount of coverage we have. Like, for example, with just currencies, right, like we've got pricing, our pricing oracle, I think recently it covers up to about 250,000 currencies. Right. Uh, so it's a lot of um, a lot of things in crypto, but it's a, it's definitely an interesting problem. It's not something that I would have picked as a a, a, a business choice originally. It's like yeah, so it's a weird kind of thing, right? You're going to build crypto tax software. It sounds pretty unsexy compared to other things. <laughs> But uh, it is actually like the domain itself is very interesting and we get to kind of touch a lot of different ideas out there. We see a lot of different things and yeah, having that aggregator layer on top of everything is an interesting space for us. So, Of course. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and again, thank you guys for doing what you do. Um, you know, like, like we were kind of mentioning in the beginning, uh, this, uh, you know, like a software is like crypto text calculator, definitely uh um, ease the uh, ease people's nerves. I'm sure when it comes uh, to uh, to tax time, <laughs> you know, uh, midway through the year. I think there's another point there I'd like to slip in. Is like you know just generally this idea of tax software for decentralized products is like really quite important because um, what you've seen like in the U.S. for example, back last year they introduced that U.S. Congress bill, and it's still uncertain what the impact of that is. But like to a large extent, there seems to be some suggestions there that, you know, decentralized exchanges, for example, would have to collect social security numbers. And it's like, but hang on, there's no middleman to collect this stuff. And so what are you doing here? You're just like enforcing centralization. You're forcing there to be a third, a trusted third party middleman. And it's really got people really understand the risk around AML, KYC, that type of thing. And, you know, that's another problem space of crypto that needs to be addressed over time, probably. But this tax thing, this is like a looming disaster, unless there's the right tooling in place that allows people to do their taxes, uh, keeping in mind kind of the decentralized ethos of the space and the whole point, right, to have capital efficiencies, to not have a financial middleman anymore. Otherwise, what is this reduced to? It's just reduced to like penny stocks on centralized exchanges. It's pretty unexciting at that point. Uh, unless you're on the right coin at the right time. Um, yeah. There you, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you definitely got a point there. <laughs> um, yeah, no, you know, it's it's funny. I think I've actually maybe used like the penny stock analogy maybe once in my life to try to tell people about what's going on in the space, but never again. <laughs> um, uh, uh, <laughs> it's my new phrase for it. Yeah. <laughs> transformation now, especially after COVID. I've seen it in their yeah. own workplace. True, true. Um, all right. Yeah, let, let's, um, let, Let's definitely move on to some of the uh, community questions. We, we actually got a bunch of them. Um, maybe we can start actually with uh, some of the ones from Twitter. Uh, the, and uh, I, I really like these because some of them are a little more generic and some of them are a little, a little more specified, but they all are very interesting. Uh, so we have one, uh, the first one coming from uh, oristat.eth on Twitter. And, he, and they ask, uh, do you report any and all sales or just when you transfer it to USD? By the way, none of this is uh, tax advice. Yeah, not tax, not tax advice. Uh, the question that actually depends on your tax jurisdiction as well. Um, but where, you know, I'm going to guess that this guy or girl is in the US because they're talking about USD. True. Um, uh, so, you know, crypto to crypto transactions, um, if you bought Bitcoin and it goes up 10x and then you sell it for ETH directly, uh, the IRS doesn't care, right? Like they they want their money, um, <laughs> right? And they're not like because what you're talking about is a rollover. Like in the tax world, what you call this potentially would be a rollover of your tax obligations, and that's actually like a tax advantage. Like imagine if you buy Tesla stock, and this happens, right? It goes up ten x. I mean, it only recently happened. And then you could go, oh, well, you know, most of my portfolio is in Tesla stock right now. I want, I want to rebalance my portfolio. I want to go 
buy Google stock? Like if you could trade Tesla stock directly for Google stock, which your brokerage could facilitate, they could just have it in their UI, right? That doesn't mean that all of a sudden your Tesla stock wasn't taxable. It just isn't, right? Like you, you got to pay the pay on the gains. The fact that you just, you know, de decided to reinvest all of that profit into the Google stock without setting aside anything for tax, you know, that's, that's, that's a risk that you took. Not saying that Google's going to go down to zero, but some stuff in crypto might. And so you got to think about this, and the burden's back on you. And it's, it's just because you call it cryptocurrency, it kind of gives it some magic, right? But the reality is it's digital transformation of real assets and, you know, what's the tax consequences. You can often just map it back to the real world. I really wish it was magic sometimes, man. <laughs> they just want their money. They don't care if I know magic. <laughs> Super cool technology. I'm extremely bullish on the space. It's just, you know, yeah. people lump this into it. Like they call it cryptocurrency or they call it NFTs. And it's like got these kind of, it's like the same thing with quantum, quantum physics or, you know, artificial intelligence. Like you, know, mm. you, you kind of, you kind of categorize this subject matter as a certain word and then it's like, oh, too hard, it's magic, it's, I can't understand it. And you see this all the time. I guess the people in this in this audience, they've arbitraged against that because there's still a market out there that think that, you know, that crypto is like a Ponzi scheme and all that stuff. They don't actually understand it. Whereas, you know, if you're listening to this, you probably get at least some of this and you probably recognize that there's other participants in the market who haven't realized the value of this space. Um, so, yeah. Definitely. No, agreed. Um, okay. Uh, we can move on to, I guess, the uh, next question here uh, by another Twitter user by the name of Soldier067. Uh, this one actually uh, would definitely apply a lot to people on Arbitrum. Um, so, let me go ahead and read it off here. Uh, if I was airdropped NFTs and still holding and its value has gone up, do I pay if I'm still holding or only when I sell? Right. Loaded question there. Yeah, so I, I, pretty much every question I'm just going to say not tax advice, my own opinion, based on no what problem. I've heard in a month. <laughs> uh, and also, it really depends on your tax jurisdiction. So, you know, and your individual circumstances, etc. cetera. Um, there's these basic kind of uh, formulas, though, from a calculation perspective that you can consider. Um, you know, this concept with airdrops, you know, first of all, is an airdrop classified as income in given your individual circumstances uh, if the answer is yes then you want to work out what the market value of that asset was when you received it because that's where the income that's how you would calculate what the income amount was for example uh, uniswap airdrop uh, when they release 400 Uniswap tokens for participating, being one of the first people to participate in Uniswap, you know, that might have been worth two grand US dollars, you might deem. Like that was the income that you received at the time of receipt. Um, and so if there is this income, then generally, you know, people go, oh, but that means I'm going to get double taxed or something. You see this on Reddit as well. Fairly misinformed comment. Um, what happens is that, you'll get taxed on that income immediately because uh, it's income. Just like if I received $1,000 or $2,000 for doing something on Upworks or freelance or whatever you're doing, um, you know, it's it's income, right? And you pay taxes on it. But then, so from the calculation point of view, it's kind of like you received US dollars, like 2000 US dollars, and then you went out and bought uni swap tokens that's kind of how they think of it right they kind of have this pseudo anonymous like pseudo transaction in the middle which was like oh you actually received us dollars and then you went and bought uni swap that's a really easy way of thinking about these calculations in a lot of circumstances and so you know if you go out and buy the uni swap and it goes up in value well then the difference is now taxable the difference not the full amount the difference and that's taxable as, you know, capital gains in a lot of tax jurisdictions. Again, not tax advice. Uh, so there's that idea. 
But there's another argument here, which is what, if you look into the details here, what was the market value at the time of the airdrop? So if you sign up to a, an exchange and they've got a special program where they airdrop in quotations, you $20 worth of Bitcoin, pretty safe to say that the market value of Bitcoin was, you know, whatever it was at that date, right? Like it's got value when you received it. But if you receive an NFT in an airdrop at the inception of the market, what's the market value? And that's, that's a bit, it's a bit argumentative, but this is where it's worth talking to a tax professional, particularly if it's significant. Um, but maybe, Maybe there was no market. Maybe the true market value was zero dollars at that time. And then when you go and sell it, that's when it's taxable. Uh, there was another point that the question had, which was like, you know, if it goes up in price. Like, do I have to pay taxes on it? Um, most of the time, it's more related to the transactions themselves. So if you transact, so if you dispose of the asset, right? That's a potential taxable gain point, but uh, it again depends on the individual circumstances and tax jurisdiction. For example, if you're a business, um, then you could have you know if you're a business in Australia, for example, you and and you know you've got this kind of time point at the end of the year where you have to take a snapshot of all your inventory. And then the gain in your inventory between financial years is also taxable. So there could be some nuances there. Um, but generally speaking, uh, it's mostly to do with the transactions themselves and the time of the transaction. But it's if it's significant, if you're sitting there on an NFT that's worth $300,000 now uh, and you got it for free, it doesn't hurt to talk to somebody about this. Um, you know, there's all these things that might come out of that in terms of tax planning as well. So, yeah. All right. Yeah. Soldier 067. I hope you're either still holding on to it. It's worth a lot or you sold it and you kept some of that uh, USDC on the side. <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> the question wasn't too long ago. So, you yeah, know, I'm sure this will help them. Um, Okay, we have a, a next question. This is definitely going to be an interesting one. I'm not sure if we covered this yet. Uh, this is from TakeTheWealth.eth, um, also from Twitter. And they ask, um, when using Aave and depositing ETH uh, as collateral, you receive a receipt token, um, AETH, you know, like a their type of ETH. Uh, is that a taxable event since it looks like a trade? Um, and... Okay, yeah, let's, let's, go, let's go with that first. We have, another, we have another part there. Yeah, now now we're getting into the depths of gray. Um, <laughs> it's getting grayer and grayer as we go. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, again, not tax advice. Uh, now, this really does start to depend on what tax jurisdiction you're in, what kind of guidance has already been put out by that tax authority. Is there any guidance? Um example in the uk recently they said you know this is actually a change of beneficial ownership and it's actually a taxable event disposal which is really crazy to a lot of users you know and you got to put this into the perspective of tax authorities there was kind of a time there when there was this idea of oh look don't sell your million dollars of ETH. instead why don't you deposit that into this place and we will give you 100K of US dollars and you can pay it back over a period of time to get out of paying taxes by selling off the ETH for 100 US dollars in the first place. And so I guess this was a preventative measure of that, which the UK HMRC put out. Now, this is getting debatable, right? Like, uh, there's also this other concept, just to throw some spanners in the work, that again, depending on your jurisdiction, the guidance that the tax authority puts out is guidance. It doesn't mean that a judge has decided that this is how things should be done in the future. And so there's still a lot of things where, you know, this does need to be decided in a court or something similar. But this is going to take a while to get there. Um, 
And it's also unlikely that there's like a blanket rule that it covers all protocols or something. Um, you know, it's the terms and conditions they'll say. You need to read the terms and conditions. And what does that even mean with a smart contract? I guess that means you need to read the smart contract. Um, so what you need to be talking about for your tax professional probably before you go and do this transaction and I mean, the tax professionals must be pretty happy because it's kind of brought their business back to life in a lot of ways. Um, there's all this new complexity, you know, just when you thought you've solved everything with TurboTax, it's like all these additional uh, uh, things that people need advice on all of a sudden. Um, but um, you, you kind of, there's this concept of beneficial ownership and are you still the true owner of this asset or have you disposed of it? somebody else like have you disposed of the with the right to buy back at a later date is this a bit more like a short trade you know what's what's the actual nature of this transaction and so you know it might be a disposal uh, depending on how you come about you know deciding this importantly you want to be tracking this that's what our software does uh, the records etc but the, in this situation uh, you, you need to think about how you want to categorize that transaction. That's really where, you know, that's where it comes back to you making a decision there. Um, importantly, uh, I mean, it might be too late to have already thought about this, but ideally you want to be seeking uh, tax advice on this type of transaction before you go and do it just to make sure that you don't do something it's one of these things where you go do something stupid and you only realize later how bad it was um so it's not, it's not super clear uh certainly interesting technology um it's very interesting um and you could do lots of weird things with b5 protocols but especially when you start getting into lending and like, you know, depositing into smart contracts, et cetera, like large sums of money. This is really where um, it'd be great to get more clarity from more tax authorities in this space. But I mean, the protocols have only been around for a couple of years and I mean, they've got their own bucket list of things to think about. Uh, yeah. Very true. Um, especially on like, that, that comment there about like you know how early the, how how, uh, how new all this stuff is um so in, in speaking of new stuff uh, the second part of, the, of uh, take the wealth question um refers to uh, liquidity protocol and best of finance uh about how, about being able to get a zero percent interest loan um for only a 0.5 percent fee and no date to pay it back and they ask if the irs will consider the loaner income <laughs> i don't know how much you can how much of this question you can answer because pretty direct there but um yeah, uh, yeah uh, it really it really just depends on the circumstances i mean i've never looked okay. at this i'm familiar with it um but i would say that you know you it's it's worth at least you're asking a question that's good yeah. um then you know for sure you want to be keeping records of this uh for sure you want to be noting down the fiat values um ideally you want to be talking to somebody beforehand if it's significant amounts of money at least then you can build up a case for why you did it this way, why you declared it that way, you know, what your thought process was. If you did get audited in that situation, you'd have it documented what your document, what your reasons were. And maybe you won't get smashed with such a, like maybe they'll, they won't penalise you or maybe they'd come to some sort of arrangement, etc. So, uh, you know, maybe it's not worth doing all that because it was 10 bucks that you're talking about. Um, and in that case, you could be really conservative. But, you know, there's the point of what is the most conservative option here. Um, usually that's kind of like, you know, what's the best outcome from the tax authority's point of view, uh, <laughs> maximising your taxes. But, um, yeah, again, it's it's... It's worth thinking about. It's uh, it's good that you're asking the question. Probably want to be asking the question outside of the Twitter post, but yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that is true. I was going to say, yeah, you got a point there. Um, and we have uh, one last question um, again from Twitter. Uh, Naruna Yogi 
Uh, and they ask, and it looks like this one's actually uh, from your part of the world there. Uh, does the ATO, which is the Australian Tax Authority, um, uh, no, sorry, Australian Tax Organization, I assume is what that means, um, have authority to ask an exchange like Binance their servers offshore for transaction history of an individual with no criminal history? Mm. I'm not sure why that second part was there, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Australian Tax Office. Um, you were close. Oh, okay. uh, so, uh, yeah, I did. I didn't know a lot about you know this world before I got into this business, actually. And it's actually surprising to me. Basically, tax authorities. I mean, this is the revenue, the way that governments get revenue to pay for things like military and stuff. Like it's a big thing for them, right? And so, like, um, the amount of um, authority that these officers, like these authorities have, is way higher than anything else you've ever seen before. They've actually, most of the time, they've got more power than the police, is the way that it's been described to me. Um, wow. So, uh, you know, like, there's, I guess, as how that entity structure themselves, it also depends on the appetite of that entity to really piss off the authority. You know, if they refuse to participate, what kind of you're talking about governments like they want their money, and people have been trying to get away with. I mean, this really comes back to can I avoid taxes if I've been trading on an international exchange that's outside my jurisdiction? You know, people have been asking how how can I avoid Taxes, how can I avoid death? These are the two things people grew on day in and day out for years, forever, like all of time. And then I come, you know, the tax authorities are they're well educated on different ways that people try to dodge taxes. And they've got lots of different ways of um, making sure that doesn't happen. You gotta be incredibly motivated to get away with it. And even then you gotta be looking over your shoulder all the time. So I don't know, is, you know, make your own decisions in life, but um, that's probably not uh, worth the weight on, it's certainly not, don't want the weight on my shoulders. Uh, yeah. Amen to that. I got to agree with you there on that one. <laughs> um, yeah, this is actually maybe um, a great time then to, 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 to kind of uh, maybe uh, end it off here. Um, just just as like a, as like a last thing, uh, for those for those people planning on, on doing their taxes, uh, what are your recommendations uh, for them to make you know tax time, which for the U.S. is actually like pretty much now uh, less of a hassle? Well, yeah, so I'll plug in the service there, CryptoTaxCalculator.io. Um, yeah. The process is you know you're adding in your wallet address, so obviously not your private key, right? Like your your wallet, your public wallet address. And you connect your API keys, you know, if you've traded on Binance, you plug in your Binance API keys, same with Coinbase, etc. It's all read only. Um, we pull in the transaction history from all these different data sources. And then we, we centralize it into one single format that's fiat denominated. And then you can run the inventory methods, which is essentially the kind of the tax algorithms over that to generate reports. Um, depending on your jurisdiction, you can spit that out as, um, you know, CSVs, Excel sheets, TurboTax format, um, or you could share that with your CPA, accountant, or whatever else you call your tax professional in your, where, wherever you are in the world. Um, and I'm sure, I think some of the guys here will organize a coupon code or something like that as well to share. Yeah, actually, I think there's one down there in the uh, in the chat. I'm not gonna lie, yeah, at first for a second, I thought that was like spam, but <laughs> um, yeah, it's an actual code, Arbitrum Forty. There, look at that. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, obviously, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, as Shane said, feel free to uh, check out Crypto Tax Calculator. You can use the link there um, in the uh, in the chat. Um, just in case you did come, uh, you know, uh, in midway to the AMA, we'll make sure to have this up on uh, YouTube shortly. So you can listen to the whole thing, uh, listen to uh, what Shane had to say. But um, yeah, Shane, thank you uh, again for coming on uh, tonight and giving us uh, all this uh, free alpha, as we like to put it.
<laughs> yeah, it's net profit, not gross profit. That's the thing you care about. So hopefully. <laughs> Oh, there you go. I like that. <laughs> All right. There you go. Well, Shane, thank you for coming on. Um, we look forward to, uh, you know, uh, talking next time. All right. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Have a good one, y'all. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys.